will be a Tiberty video recording. It involves inverse trig functions, their derivatives, their integrals, and also their properties. I do want to begin with their properties first. Um, every single one of you will have this particular handout. This is a reminder of the six trig functions and their domains and their ranges. For the sine wave or sine function, the domain is all the numbers and the range is restricted to be between negative one and positive one inclusively. Uh, for the cosine function, the domain is all the numbers. The range is restricted to be between negative one and positive one inclusively. This graph is the graph of both cosine and sine together on the same xy plane from negative 2 pi to positive 2 pi. And you can see that the domain is all real numbers for both of those. And the range for both is from negative 1 to positive 1. That's something they have in common. Sine is odd and cosine is even. For your tangent function, the domain is restricted to be all numbers x, such that x cannot be plus and minus pi over 2, plus and minus 3 pi over 2, plus and minus 5 pi over 2, etc., etc. So that's increments of plus and minus pi over 2. And that is because tangent is sine over cosine, and cosine is in the denominator, and it cannot be 0. And so x cannot be plus and minus pi over 2. The cosine of pi over 2 is 0. The range is obviously all real numbers. For cotangent, is cosine over sine. So the domain is all x's, but 0 plus and minus pi plus and minus 2 pi plus and minus 3 pi. It is not defined where your sine of x will be 0 in the denominator and that's at increments of pi. The range again is all real numbers. On the second sheet, you will see secant and cosecant. Cosecant is listed first, one over sine. So x cannot be zero, plus and minus pi, plus and minus two pi. Those are your vertical asymptotes. The function is undefined at these places. And the range is y less than or equal to negative 1, greater than or equal to positive 1. And you can see that depicted in the graph. For secant, it's 1 over cosine. So x cannot be plus and minus pi over 2, plus and minus 3 pi over 2, plus and minus 5 pi over 2, increments of pi over 2. The range, again, is all y's less than or equal to negative 1, and all y's greater than or equal to positive 1. Make sure that you know the six basic trig functions, their domains and their ranges. You should already know this from a trig class or calculus one. The focus of section 6-7 is not the trig functions, but their inverses. And I want to show you this. The next two handouts deal with the derivative formulas for the inverse uh, sine functions and the integral formulas for the inverse sine functions. You notice it's not all of them. For the integral formulas, it's just inverse sine, inverse tangent, and inverse secant. And it does have the derivative formulas for all six of those. Um, the rest of the handout deals with the hyperbolics, and we will cover the hyperbolics in section 6-8. So for now, section 6-7, you will only focus on this box and this box in terms of formulas. Section 6-7 begins by saying that trig functions in general do not have inverses. And I would like to put that statement on the document camera. It comes from page 462, and it says, this is a little bit sideways here. It says the six basic trig functions do not have inverses because their graphs repeat periodically and hence do not pass the horizontal line test. 
To circumvent this problem, we will restrict the domains of the trig functions to produce one-to-one -one functions and then define the inverse trig functions to be the inverses of these restricted functions. And then on the next page, it gives four of the special trig functions and their inverses of sine, cosine, tangent, and sine. And it shows the domain and the ranges for each of those. Um, I wish for you to know, in general, the graphs of sine, cosine, tangent, and sine. If you remember from a few moments ago, and this is on page 463, the domain of sine, um, the true domain of sine does not have a restriction. It's all real numbers. But to make it have an inverse, we restrict the domain to be between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. Same deal with cosine. In, in a normal situation, the domain of cosine is all real numbers. But to make it have an inverse, the domain has to be restricted between 0 and pi inclusively. So what you see here is the graph of sine and cosine on their restricted domains. And for each of these, again, the range is from negative 1 to 1, negative 1 to 1. And then you have the graph of inverse sine and inverse cosine. Basically, their domains and their ranges are switched around. So for sine above, if its restricted domain is between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2, the range for inverse sine is between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. The range for sine above is between negative 1 and 1, so the domain for inverse sine below is between negative 1 and positive 1. For cosine, the restricted domain is between uh, 0 and pi. So for inverse cosine, the restricted range is between 0 and pi. For cosine, the range is between negative 1 and 1, so the domain for inverse cosine is between negative 1 and 1. For tangent and secant, for tangent to have an inverse, the domain is restricted to be between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. Do not include those asymptotes. The range again is all real numbers. So when you take a look at the graph of inverse tangent, its domain is all real numbers. And its range is restricted to be between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. For secant, which is 1 over cosine, the domain is restricted to be between 0 and pi, but not to include this asymptote of pi over 2, so here to here. The range is all y's greater than or equal to 1 or y less than or equal to negative 1. For inverse secant, the domain is all x's less than or equal to negative 1 or x's greater than or equal to 1. The range is between 0 and pi, but don't include pi over 2. So know the graphs of these four and their inverses and know their domains and their ranges for all eight of these. So you have to know that. I am going to go over the properties of inverse trig functions before I give you the derivative and the integral um, formulas and we we'll work a few problems from the textbook. Um, if you want to see a chart on page 464 is a chart of those inverse uh, functions, inverse sine, cosine, tangent, and secant. And it gives their domains and their, uh, their ranges and how they are related to each other. Um, remember, inverse functions, their domains and ranges are switched. They are also reflected about the line y equals x when you graph them on the same xy plane and you graph inverses of each other. They are reflected about the line y equals x. And it's also true that inverse sine of sine x is x, uh, sine of inverse sine is x, and they do list the restriction. Inverse sine of sine x is x for all x's between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. Sine of inverse sine x is x for all x's between negative 1 and 1. So these restrictions depend upon what's on the inside, the domain of the inside function. The restricted domain of sine is between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. The restricted uh, domain of inverse sine is between negative 1 and positive 1. And those would be true statements. 
I am going to work a few of the problems in the textbook, and we have to work uh, with trig, inverse trig uh, identities, and then we'll do some of the derivative problems and integral problems. The problems that I want to show you are problems um, dealing with the calculator, just some extra practice dealing with the calculator. So I will entitle this Properties of Inverse Trig Functions. So again, make sure that you know their graphs and their domains and their ranges. And I'll write that down. You are responsible for graphs, domains, and ranges. Especially the four that they list on page 464. 460. Uh, three. The four special trig functions and their special inverse functions and the domains and ranges for those. And then properties, I'm just going to show you a few calculator prob problems. Um, one problem that I want to uh, speak with you about is solving the trig function sine of x is equal to one half. When you solve this trig function, or excuse me, trig equation, you would be able to see that there are an unlimited number of solutions for this. If you think about the unit circle and you think about at 30 degrees, uh, cosine of 30 degrees is the square root of 3 over 2 and sine is a half. And then at 60 degrees, cosine is a half and sine is the square root of 3 over 2. And then you have uh, 90 degrees, so 30, 60, 90, um, 120, 150. At 150 degrees, you have a cosine of negative square root of 3 over 2 and a sine of 1 half. And you could go around and around and around and around forever and ever and ever. And you would be able to identify an infinite number of angles where the sine of that angle would give you uh, 1 half. One answer would be 30 degrees or pi over 6. And another answer would be 150 degrees. Um, and that should be uh, 5 pi over 6. And I can show you that on the calculator. If you're in radian mode, and you take the sine of pi over 6, you get 0.5 and the sine of 5 pi divided by 6 is equal to 0.5. Another answer in these two quadrants, quadrant 3 and quadrant 4, Sine is negative, so in these two we would be able to give an angle where sine is a negative one half. So I'm not interested in quad three and quad four. But I will say that another answer would be two pi plus pi over six, which is twelve pi over six plus pi over six, which is thirteen pi over six. So you would go one time around and then another pi over 6 would bring you to 13 pi over 6. And when you put that into the calculator, you get sine 13 pi divided by 6. And you get 0.5. 
Therefore, there are an infinite number of, you know, answers to this particular equation. The point of this is to tell you that when you go to solve this, and you say x is inverse sine of one half, and you take a look at what the calculator gives you, they only give you one solution. And I'll show you that. Inverse sine of 0.5, and this is in radian mode. You may want to change to degree mode. And you get 30 degrees. So the angle they give you, inverse sine of 0.5 is 30 degrees. The reason they give you this answer of 30 degrees or pi over 6 is because of this. I'll just remind you, when you have y equals sine x, its domain is restricted to be between, and if you go back to the graph, its domain is restricted to be between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2 and its range is all real numbers. And then when you think about its inverse, inverse sine, its domain is all real numbers. And its range is restricted to be between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. So when you put inverse sine in the calculator and you get 30 degrees or pi over 6, it, it is because of this. That that pi over 6 is between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. So that's the solution that they give there for that one. Again, as a reminder, um, inverse sine and just regular sine wave looks like this. The domain is here sine from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2 and then the domain uh, the range is negative 1 to 1. So for inverse sine its domain is negative 1 to 1 but its range is negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. Again their domains and ranges are switched. So on the calculator, when you take inverse sine, the answer they give you belongs to this, the range of inverse sine, which is pi over 6. Same deal if they ask you to calculate, um, let's see, inverse sine. square root of 2 for 2, and you do x is inverse sine of square root of 2 for 2, you're going to get 45 degrees for pi over 4. And that pi over 4 is in this range for inverse sine. It's between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. And that's the answer the calculator gives you, even though there's an infinite number of solutions to this particular equation. When you do inverse tangent, so tangent x is equal to 1, again has unlimited solutions. x is equal to inverse tangent of 1. You will see that your calculator gives you um, 45 degrees or pi over 4. And I'll show you that here. And then we'll talk about, um, so inverse sine tangent of 1 is 45 degrees. By the way, if you're in radian mode, inverse tangent of 1 is 0.785. You're supposed to know that that's um, pi over 4. And it is equal to pi over 4 or 45 degrees.
Um, as a reminder, you could actually go from high over four to degrees if you put that in as 180 degrees over pi, and you would see that the pi's cancel, and so 180 divided by four is gonna give you 45 degrees. So you can switch back and forth from uh, radians to degrees. Um, you either multiply by 180 over pi or pi over 180. In this case, if you wanna go to degrees, you multiply by 180 over pi. Now, why is this true for tangent? If you remember for tangent to have an inverse, its domain is restricted to be between negative pi over two and positive pi over two. And the range is all real numbers. So there is not a restriction there. But inverse tangent, when you see the graph of that, its domain is all real numbers and its range is restricted to be between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2 don't include plus and minus pi over 2. Again, the answer that you have here with the calculator is pi over 4 and it makes sense because pi over 4 is in this range. So that's how the calculator just gives you the one solution when there's actually an infinite number of solutions. One other thing that you may want to review, um, some of you may need help with this. Um, if I ever ask you to take inverse secant, or let's say this, secant of x is equal to the square root of 2, and you have to solve for x, um, x is inverse secant of square root of 2. You do not have a inverse secant button on the calculator. So you have to put it in as inverse cosine of 1 over the square root of 2, which is going to be 45 degrees or pi over 4 for your answer. Um, so do remember that. Um, they list that as an exercise, and I'll point you to that. That exercise is number 56. I can put this on the problem in the document camera. Let's see. Number 56. Show that inverse cotangent, and this is on page 470. Inverse cotangent of x is inverse tangent of 1 over x if x is greater than 0. Um, and it's also, believe it or not, pi plus inverse tangent of 1 over x for x less than 0. Um, you're not going to have to prove this. Inverse secant is inverse cosine of 1 over x, which is what we just did with uh, inverse secant of square root of 2. And then inverse cosecant is inverse sine of 1 over x. And that's how you have to plug it into the calculator. Because you don't have an inverse cotangent button, an inverse secant button, or an inverse cosecant button. There. You will not have to do number 56. You will not have to do that, so don't worry about that. Now, I want to work a couple of the homework problems in the section that deal with properties, and then we'll talk about inverse trig identities. The problem that I want to do is number one. They say in the textbook, given that theta is inverse tangent of four thirds, Find the exact values of sine theta, cosine theta, cotangent theta, secant theta, and cosecant theta. And I'll write that down. Theta is inverse tangent of four thirds. Sine theta, cosine theta, cotangent theta, secant theta, and cosecant theta. We can find these. And the best way to find these is through definition. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. Cotangent is adjacent over opposite. Secant is hypotenuse over adjacent. And cosecant is hypotenuse over opposite. 
With this particular example, this means that tangent of theta is four-thirds, which is opposite over adjacent. Your triangle would look like this. Here's theta. Opposite side is four, adjacent side is three. And you can find your hypotenuse C by the fact that three squared plus four squared equals C squared. And that's nine plus 16 equals C squared. C squared equals 25. C equals plus or minus square root of 25 plus or minus five. But we go with the positive five for the hypotenuse. So the Pythagorean uh, theorem there for that. By definition then, sine is going to be opposite over hypotenuse, which is four fifths. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, three fifths. Cotangent is adjacent over opposite, three fourths. Secant is hypotenuse over adjacent, five thirds. And cosecant is hypotenuse over opposite, five fourths. So you can give the exact answers for those just by knowing the definition of tangent. And um, you can know their decimal answers as well. Four fifths is 0.8 for eight tenths. Um, cosine um, is three fifths or six tenths. Cotangent is three fourths or 0.75. Secant is five thirds or 1.6 repeating. Cosecant is five fourths or 1.25 from that. And you don't need a calculator for that problem. The next problem that I wanted to show you is um, number five. They give sine of two inverse cosine of three fifths. And basically it says to evaluate the expression and give the exact answer without a calculator. To find this without a calculator, um, you would actually let theta be inverse cosine of three fifths, draw a triangle, three fifths, uh, the Adjacent side would be 3, hypotenuse 5, and then therefore the opposite side would have to be 4. It satisfies the Pythagorean theorem. A squared plus B squared equals hypotenuse squared. Then you would see that as sine of 2 theta, which by the double angle formula is 2 sine theta cosine theta. And then you can look at your triangle. Sine of theta is going to be 4 fifths, opposite over hypotenuse. And cosine of theta is 3 fifths, adjacent over hypotenuse. And 2 times 4 times 3 is going to be 24. And then 5 times 5 is 25. So 24, uh, 20 fifths would be your final answer as an exact answer. If you wanted to check that with the calculator, again, you may want to be in um, gradient mode or degree mode. I am going to just be really, I'll just be in radian mode. And that's the sine of two inverse cosine of three fifths. And you get 0.96 as a decimal. And if you go to math and change that to fraction, you get 24 25ths as your answer there. It's best to know how to do it by hand using the triangle. And that's going to help us uh, with our trig, inverse trig identities in this section. That's the next part of the lecture because I want to show you how to do problems like number seven. In order to show you how to do problems like number seven, and what I'll do is I'll call this a 
identities for inverse trig functions. Identities for inverse trig functions. What I'm going to do is let beta equal inverse sine of x and draw a triangle. Here's theta. This means that sine of theta will give you x, which is actually x over 1, which is opposite over hypotenuse, x and 1. By the Pythagorean theorem, the adjacent side to theta has to be the square root of 1 minus x squared. To prove that, and this is the side that we needed to find, we could let that be b, so that b squared plus x squared is equal to 1 squared. b squared is 1 squared minus x squared, so b is the positive square root of 1 minus x squared. The importance of this is that now we let alpha be inverse cosine of x. And here's alpha. That makes sense because that means that cosine of alpha will give you x, which is adjacent side over hypotenuse. Here is alpha. Adjacent to that is x, and hypotenuse is 1. And this leads us to our inverse trig identity. Theta plus alpha must be 90 degrees, or pi over 2. And that means that inverse sine of x plus inverse cosine of x will give us pi over 2. And I'll box that. There's your inverse tree identity. Inverse sine of x plus inverse cosine of x will give you pi over 2, or 90 degrees. From the triangle above, you can answer several questions, and they do this in the textbook. For example, you could answer cosine of inverse sine x. Well, that's like answering cosine of theta above. And theta is here, which is inverse sine x, and cosine of theta is adjacent over hypotenuse. So it's the square root of 1 minus x squared over 1. So it's just the square root of 1 minus x squared. They can also ask you question number 2. The tangent of inverse sine x, which is also the tangent of theta. And if you go back to your triangle, tangent of theta is opposite over adjacent. So it's x over the square root of 1 minus x squared. Now, number seven will answer some of these, and I'll put that on the document camera. Number seven looks like this. Complete the identities using the triangle method. By the way, this is called the triangle method. And I'm going to focus on set, uh, number seven letters A and B, but they all work the same. You'll basically draw a triangle based upon what's on the inside. Number seven says, letter A, for us to find the cosine of inverse tangent x. In order to answer this question, draw the triangle. Theta is inverse tangent x. Therefore, tangent of theta is equal to x, which is x over 1, which is opposite over adjacent. So your triangle doesn't have to be beautiful. It looks like this. Opposite is x, adjacent is 1. x squared plus 1 squared equals hypotenuse squared. 
So C is the square root of uh, 1 plus x squared, or x squared plus 1. So find the hypotenuse there. And then you can answer this question. Um, cosine is going to be, by definition, adjacent over hypotenuse. So the answer is 1 over the square root of 1 plus x squared. Adjacent hypotenuse. And again, I let the hypotenuse be c. So a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So c is the square root of 1 plus x squared. And the cosine of inverse tangent, or the cosine of theta, is adjacent over hypotenuse. So 1 over the square root of 1 plus x squared. Letter B, the tangent of inverse cosine x. Again, you'll let theta be inverse cotangent of x, so cosine of theta is x, which is adjacent over hypotenuse. You will have your triangle. Adjacent side is x, hypotenuse is 1. The opposite side would have to be the square root of 1 minus x squared, if you saw for that side. And then the tangent of theta, or the tangent of inverse cosine, is opposite over adjacent. So it's the square root of 1 minus x squared, all divided by x. Again, with these particular problems, Take what's on the inside and let that be theta. From that, you can form a triangle by saying that in this particular case, cosine of theta is x. Use the definition of cosine theta as adjacent over hypotenuse, and that gives you two sides of the triangle so that you can find the third side. If you know all three sides of the triangle, you can find any of these. By definition, tangent is opposite over adjacent, so there's your answer. And the basic process is for all of these problems. Make sure you practice on those and you know how to work problems like those uh, for the test. Now we're ready for the derivative uh, formulas and the integral formulas. I want to refer to the handout once again. Again, we want to go here and here. I'm just going to work with a few derivative problems first, and then we'll do some integral problems. The first derivative problem that I want to show you is number um, 16, and I'll just write it down. Y is equal to inverse cosine of x plus 1 divided by 2. It's going to help to look up the formula for the derivative of inverse cosine. And I'll write that here. I believe it says inverse cosine of u. On the sheet, it is negative 1 over the square root of 1 minus u squared du dx. Thereby, you can see that u in this case is going to be the x plus 1 divided by 2, which I think you should say 1 half x plus a half. They are equivalent to each other. And then the derivative of u is just a half. Setting this up with the formula, this is negative 1 divided by a square root of 1 minus u squared times du dx. Um, u is x plus 1 divided by 2. You will have to simplify these derivatives. I'm going to block this off. And that would give you negative 1 divided by 2 square roots of 1 minus x plus 1 quantity squared divided by 4. So I squared the 4 and I squared the binomial x plus 1. There is a trick here. The 2 that's already part of the formula, the derivative formula, 
is going to be changed to something that's useful and it's changed to the square root of 4. That way you can distribute under the radical and your final answer is the square root of 4 minus x plus 1 quantity squared. There is no need to FOIL out x plus 1 quantity squared, but if you do, um, I will not count off, but they do not FOIL this out in the um, solution manual. They leave it as negative 1 over the square root of 4 minus x plus 1 quantity squared. Negative 1 is in the numerator. The next problem that I want to show you is problem number 24. Problem number 24. Number 24 looks like this. The natural log of inverse cosine of x. You basically have to use the chain rule here. The overall outside function is natural log and the inside function is inverse cosine. With the chain rule, remember it's the derivative of the outside evaluated at the inside times the derivative of the inside. The overall formula here is that for natural log of u, and that's 1 over u du dx. The u in this case is inverse cosine of x, and its derivative, if you look on the sheet here, is negative 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. In this case, u is equal to x, so du equals dx. And then you're ready for the chain rule. Derivative of outside, which is natural log, looks like this. Evaluated at the inside, which is your u, so there's the derivative of the outside evaluated at inside. That's your 1 over u. Times the derivative of your u. And when you combine the two together, the solution manual says negative 1 over parentheses inverse cosine of x square root of 1 minus x squared. They leave it just like that. Negative 1 over inverse cosine of x square root of 1 minus x squared. Final answer. Number 66. Y is equal to the square root of inverse cotangent x. And this would be rewritten as inverse cotangent of x to the 1 half power. Again, you will need the chain rule. One formula that you want to look up on your sheet is the derivative for inverse cotangent, but that is just x, not u. So it's negative 1 over 1 plus x squared, and I'll write that down. And this is straight from the sheet. And chain rule. Derivative of outside looks like this. Evaluated at the inside, which is inverse cotangent of x, times the derivative of the inside, which we, we found that by looking that up. The final answer is going to be a negative 1 in the numerator, 2 square roots of inverse cotangent x in the denominator times parentheses 1 plus x squared. These parentheses around the 1 plus x squared are very, very important. And that's how the solution angle gives this answer. Negative 1 divided by 2 square roots of inverse cotangent x because this becomes a negative 1 half right here. So move it to the denominator. It becomes a positive 1 half exponent and then times the quantity 1 plus x squared. Just a few more derivative problems. The next 
problem that I want to show you, and some of these can be a little bit tricky. But some of them are also my favorite. Number 22. Y is equal to 1 over inverse tangent X. And you have to find its derivative. Uh, you could actually go through the uh, quotient rule. But I do want to tell you this. This is just something off to the side. One year a student said that 1 over inverse tangent X is equal to inverse cotangent X. And that's just not true. And to show you that, you could let x be 0.5 and plug in 1 divided by inverse tangent of 0.5 and then take inverse cotangent of 0.5. One divided by inverse tangent of 0.5 is 2.15681043.2. Inverse cotangent of 0.5 is inverse tangent of um, 1 divided by 0.5, which is basically inverse tangent of 2. 1.10714871818. One Therefore, they are not equivalent to each other. And I strongly recommend you put those into your calculator. And I'm just verifying now with my calculator. 2.15681043.2. And then, since we don't have an inverse cotangent button, we have to say inverse tangent of 1 divided by 0.5, which is really inverse tangent of 2. 1.10714871. You can see they're not equivalent to each other. Therefore, you cannot say that. Some students do. And they think, oh, if they're equivalent, then you can find the derivative. The derivative formula for inverse cotangent x is given on this sheet. So that's just not how this one is done. If you want to avoid the quotient rule, you could rewrite this as inverse tangent to the power of negative 1, and then you could do it this way, chain rule, derivative of outside, evaluated at the inside, which is inverse tangent, times the derivative of the inside, and the derivative of an inverse tangent x is 1 over 1 plus x squared. Again, u equals x, so du um, dx is equal to 1, or du equals dx. So I'm just going to say 1 over 1 plus x squared here. And you'll simplify. That's going to be a negative inverse tangent x to the negative 2 power times 1 over 1 plus x squared. The final answer, you have to be very careful, is a negative 1 in the numerator. And I'm going to put 1 plus x squared with parentheses around it. And then inverse tangent of x quantity squared. Be very careful on how you express this final answer. So negative 1 in the numerator, and the denominator is 1 plus x squared, parentheses are needed. And then that's inverse tangent quantity squared. And that's the answer they have in the solution there. Now, a problem like number 21 is very nice. Y equals tangent x to the power of negative 1 is very simple. Um, this is the same as 1 over tangent x, which is cotangent x. And the derivative of cotangent x is negative cosecant squared x. And that's just from calculus 1. Memorization that the derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant squared x. Very, very neat problem. Another uh, derivative problem that I want to show you that's very, very interesting 
is number uh, 18. Number 18. And this is one where I think I'll give you the answer that they have in the solution manual. And then we'll go from there. Number 18 says, why is the inverse cosine of cosine x? Some of you may be tempted to say, oh, that's equal to x. Therefore, y prime is equal to 1, which is kind of true. But there's actually a two-part answer to this. Um, the answer in the solution manual is equal to 1 when sine of x is greater than 0 and negative 1 when sine of x is less than 0. And I want to show you how that's a true statement. Let's just start over. Y is equal to inverse cosine of cosine x. If you do your chain rule, the inside function is cosine x and therefore du dx is equal to negative sine x. If you look up your formula for the derivative of inverse cosine u, you get negative 1 over the square root of 1 minus u squared du dx. And that's from this sheet. U in this case is cosine x and its derivative is negative sine x. So this formula is the chain rule for this problem. Therefore, y prime is negative 1 over the square root of 1 minus u squared times negative sine x. And here I put cosine of x because u is cosine x. This is going to become sine x divided by the square root of 1 minus cosine squared x which is sine x divided by the square root of sine squared x. And let me remind you where that's coming from. Sine squared x plus cosine squared x equals 1, Pythagorean identity. So sine squared x is 1 minus cosine squared x. And then we have sine of x is over the absolute value of sine x. And let me tell you where that's coming from. The definition of absolute value. When I first gave you the definition of absolute value of x, I said it was x for x greater than or equal to 0 and negative x for x less than 0. I also said the absolute value of x is the square root of x squared. There are two definitions for the absolute value of x. So the absolute value of sine x is also the square root of sine squared x according to this definition. And then here is where we get our two part. Sine over sine. If sine is positive here, then this is going to be 1. If sine is negative here, your denominator is always positive. Then it's going to be negative 1. And there's your final answer for that particular problem. That one was really neat, and that's the answer they give in the solution manual. Make sure you know that particular type of problem. Now, the rest of the problems, I want to work on integrals for you. To do those, the formulas that we use here, Notice that it's only inverse sine, tangent, and secant. So you don't have to worry about inverse cosine, inverse cotangent, or inverse cosine. The first problem that I want to show you, some of these are a little bit uh, easier than others, would be number 32. Yeah, 32. 32 looks like this. dx divided by 1 plus 16x squared. What you would do, and obviously we do know it's from this section, I highly recommend that you look at your formulas that you're given and decide which one of the three it most closely resembles. 
you notice it's a squared minus u squared, a squared plus u squared, and u times the square root of u squared minus a squared. We don't even have a square root here in the denominator, so there's a big indication that it's inverse tangent. To allow you to see that more clearly, you could see this as 1 plus 4x quantity squared. And then I'll write down the formula for inverse tangent. 1 divided by a squared plus u squared du is equal to 1 over a inverse tangent of u over a plus c. In this particular case, you would have a box. I would ask you for u, I would ask you for du, and I would ask you for a. a is an understood one here. Then you would change over to u. You would need a 4 on the inside and a 1 fourth on the outside. Once you make your successful change over to u, that's when you really see that this is indeed inverse tangent, where a is equal to 1. So your final answer is 1 fourth inverse tangent of u over a, which is just 4x plus c. So plugging it in here, 1 over 1 inverse tangent of u over 1 plus c, which is inverse tangent, u is 4x plus c. And I forgot, the, this is just from the formula, but remember we have that overall 1 fourth outside here, so don't forget the 1 fourth. So the final answer is 1 fourth inverse tangent of 4x plus c for this one. A is equal to 1, and U is 4X. Another example, which is a definite integral, is number 40. Number 40 is very interesting. It goes from negative square root of 2 to a negative 2 over the square root of 3. And it's dx divided by x square root of x squared minus 1. When you look at your formulas, this actually matches up with inverse secant exactly. And I'll write that down. The only thing is that u is equal to x, and so du equals dx. Therefore, you could also write the formula this way. 1 divided by x square root of x squared minus a squared dx is equal to 1 over a inverse secant absolute value of x over a plus c in this case, because u is equal to x. And this is exactly the formula here. And a would be equal to 1. x squared minus a squared, a is equal to 1. Therefore, there's nothing that needs to be done. This is 1 over 1, inverse secant, absolute value of x over 1, from negative square root of 2 to negative 2 over the square root of 3. And that's inverse secant, absolute value of x, negative square root of 2 to negative 2 over the square root of 3. And you will evaluate. That's going to be inverse secant, absolute value of negative 2 over the square root of 3, minus inverse secant, absolute value of negative square root of 2. That is inverse secant of 2 over the square root of 3 minus inverse secant square root of 2. You can put these in the calculator because we did review this. You would get pi over 6 and then minus pi over 4. 
And that's going to be 2 pi over 12 minus 3 pi over 12. Final answer is negative pi over 12 for this particular problem. There was no U substitution needed. It was exactly the definition of inverse secant where A is equal to 1 and U is equal to X. You did not have to change your limits. You just had to evaluate the right one. Number uh, six, 49, letter C. Number 49, letter C. Looks like this. Dx divided by x square root of x square minus pi. For this particular problem, one thing you may want to do is see this as dx over x square root of x squared minus the square root of pi quantity squared. If you ever have under a radical a difference of squares or sum of squares, you may want to rewrite it as a difference square of squares or sum of squares. When you look at this, this is again inverse secant. If you see this as 1 over x square root of x squared minus a squared dx equals 1 over a inverse secant absolute value of x over a plus c. And that's the case where u equals x. And I'm looking at the sheet that u is equal to x. In this case, a is the square root of pi. Therefore, this answer would be 1 over the square root of pi, 1 over a, inverse secant, absolute value of x over the square root of pi, plus c. Now, the solution manual stops here, but I would like to see this as the square root of pi over pi, inverse secant, absolute value, square root of pi x over pi, plus c. So I would like to see it rationalized, especially since it's easy. 1 over the square root of pi is the square root of pi over pi. So it should not take long at all to rationalize that. And you do have to leave the absolute value bars very important. Let me show you another um, definite integral. And I think that'll be it. This one is number 42. And it looks like this, 1 to the square root of e. This one can be a little bit deceptive. You may say, oh, this again is inverse secant, but it's not. It's actually, um, if you look at your three formulas, it's actually inverse sine. Inverse sine, not inverse secant. So it's this one. I'm going to write this down and prove it to you. The more that you do of these and more you practice, the more you'll be able to pick out which formula best fits the problem. It's really not until you complete your U substitution that you see which formula is the best. Again, I would ask you for U in a box, which is natural log of X, and then DU in a box. And the new limits, x is 1, so u is natural log of 1, which is 0. x is the square root of e, so u is natural log square root of e, which is natural log of e to the 1 half, which is 1 half natural log of e, which is just 1 half because the natural log of e is 1. And I believe you can see it, especially if I take that 1 over x and move it to the side and put it in front of the dx. I haven't changed the problem at all because this is multiplication. So dx over x is the same as 1 over x times dx or dx, uh, 1 over x dx. And then changing over to u, it's going to go from 0 to a half, 1 over the square root of 1 minus u squared d. And that's where you see it fits the formula for inverse sine. 
and that's going to be inverse sine of u over a. By the way, I'll ask you for a. a is 1 in this case. So it's just going to be inverse sine of u from 0 to a half. Inverse sine of a half minus inverse sine of 0. And that's pi over 6 minus 0, which final answer is pi over 6, which is 30 degrees there. You want to put that in your calculator. minus 4x squared. Remember I said if you see a difference of squares, we write it as a difference of squares. So it's 3 squared minus 2x quantity squared. Therefore, a is 3 and u is 2x. And du dx is 2, so du is 2dx. I would need a 2 on the inside and a 1 half on the outside. And then You have this, and I made a mistake here, I apologize. This is 2x here. It's important. And what you would do is change over to u. When you change over to u, it's 1 half du divided by the square root of 3 squared minus u squared. And you would see that that fits the formula for inverse sine. And therefore, it's 1 half inverse sine of u over a, which is u over 3 plus c, 1 half inverse sine of 2x over 3 plus c. And this is not really a bad problem, especially if you rewrite 9 minus 4x squared as 3 squared minus 2x quantity squared, so that you see that a is 3 and u is 2x here. And this was a 2x here. And then you change over to u. When you change over to u, that's when you see it's the formula for inverse sine, where a is 3. And the other one that I wanted to put up here, which is really, really hard, is this particular problem, number 43, um, on page 470. It goes from 1 to 3, and it's dx over the square root of x, um, x plus 1. This one is kind of tricky. It doesn't fit the, the norm. Um, I said let u be the square root of x, and that's x to the 1 half. Therefore, x is equal to u squared. If u is x to the 1 half, then du is 1 half x to the negative 1 half. This is what I did here. I took the 1 over x plus 1 and put it here, and 1 over the square root of x dx, and I put it here. So I, I didn't change anything. The 1 over square root of x, I made it x to the negative 1 half power beside dx, because that's going to help me with my du. Um, for du, I need a 1 half on the inside and a 2 on the outside, and that's what I did here. And my new limits, x is equal to 1, so u is the square root of 1, which is 1. x is 3, so u is the square root of 3. And I'm ready to change over to u. So 2 times the definite integral from 1 to the square root of 3. 1 over, remember up here, if u is the square root of x, then x is u squared. So x is equal to u squared plus 1, and then the 1 half x to the negative 1 half dx is all of my du. And then you see that this is the formula for inverse tangent, where a is equal to 1. Therefore, it's 2 inverse tangent of u over a, which is just u, or u over 1, from 1 to the square root of 3. And evaluate square root of 3 and then 1, and that's 60 degrees and 45 degrees. 
4 pi over 12 and 3 pi over 12 is pi over 12 times 2. So your final answer is pi over 6. Make sure you know how to do a problem like this one. Again, if you see this problem, let u be the square root of x. Therefore, x is u squared. And it then all falls apart from there. If you let u be the square root of x, then this x here is going to be your u squared. And by letting u be the square root of x or x to the 1 half, du is 1 half x to the negative 1 half dx. And that's where you're going to um, use this. This is actually the square root of x in the denominator, which when you move it up to the numerator becomes x to the negative 1 half power. So that helps you with your du. Again, the key is that u is the square root of x. Once you change over to u, and that's here, you see that this fits the formula for inverse tangent. And that's basically it for this particular um, section 6-7. I am going to entrust that you read the section um, or you watch this particular video and you work on several of the problems on your own. And then I will allow you to ask questions in class. Um, we'll see how this works and then I may actually post the video for the hyperbolics as well. Um, Again, practice the problems and then I'll give you an opportunity in class to ask questions. Thank you so much.